Diggs. And of course, we've got another guest with us. Um, we're very lucky to have Taylor LaChapelle here. Is that how you pronounce it? Okay. Yep, that's how you pronounce it. There we go. we got Taylor here. She is a four, four-time world champion, nine-time national champion. Been competing since you were 13, correct? Yep. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, so Taylor, we'll just go ahead and jump in right here. What is your favorite memory from your entire powerlifting career? Well, that's a tough one because, obviously, I've been lifting for almost 10 years, and there's a lot of favorites, but I think one – that really stands out um, would have been 2017 sub junior worlds. Um, my last deadlift, I already knew that I wasn't going to win, but I could, I had the opportunity to pull for the record. And I don't know if you go back on my Instagram, it's, there's a video on there, but it was a real grinder and I got it. And I was just the feeling um, I was so happy when I pulled it, even though I was obviously upset because I didn't have the opportunity to win, but it was just, I don't know. I was just, uh, super happy. What, uh, where was that world's at? Uh, that was in Orlando. Okay. Uh, Cause I saw you've been to a couple different places. Um, uh, what, what's your favorite place that you've been to? Uh, probably Prague, Czech Republic. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I've also been to Hungary and um, Poland, oh, wow. as well as Canada. Yeah, golly, it, it's a lot of you get a lot of lifting experience. I'll say that that's that's really impressive. How yeah. what what do you think has been part of you being able to be in the uh, powerlifting industry so long? Um, well, I actually I started lifting um, when I was in sixth grade with my dad. Uh, he used to go to the weight room a lot. Um, and he kind of taught me how to squat and bench. And then when I was in seventh grade, um, I joined the powerlifting club at my, um, high school and, um, I had really good coaches and it was a really good team. And, um, I've just been able to continue throughout high school. And then, uh, after I graduate, I still am able to train with my high school coach. So he helps me a lot too. Yeah, that was going to be one of my first questions. I noticed that the, the very first meet on open powerlifting was in 2013, the Women's National Championships. And I was kind of wondering how you were able to go to a national championship so young, but I figured it was kind of something like that, where in, in middle school you were so strong that you were able to, to join the high school team. Um, right, yeah. So um, we let middle schoolers join the club um, in our at Adams Friendship. And um, – I actually, my eighth grade year, I went to high school nationals in Denver and I competed as an exhibition lifter so that I could qualify for women's nationals, which was in Orlando also. And then um, it worked out that I turned 14 um, before women's nationals. So then I could um, be in the running for the national team. Okay. What, what is an exhibition lifter? I've never heard of that. So I competed just to get the qualifying total, um, but I wasn't, like, competing against any of the high schoolers. I was just lifting. Oh, okay. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. I got you. So, so you would say you've been doing this for almost 10 years, going on a long time. And yeah. what would you say is, like, the biggest factor in keeping you healthy? What was that? What, what do you say is, like, the biggest factor in keeping you healthy and able to continue to lift? Um, probably just the support that I get, like from my parents, um, and my coach and I don't know, I just love doing it. I couldn't see my life without it. So I don't know. It's a really, um, it's a stress reliever for me. Like I train, uh, three to four times a week and it's just a nice break from schoolwork. So I got you. It was this. I, 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 I mean, I stopped your Instagram a little bit just so we could prepare for. I could prepare for this a little bit, and I saw some of your lifts. I was like, "Wow, this girl is crazy strong." I'm sure Seth was the same thing we were talking a little bit about before the podcast. We were like, "Wow, this girl is crazy strong," and it's part of the reason you seem like you you love it and you've been in it for eight to ten years. So, and what do you think has been 
Well, how has your training differed from like when you were in high school with your dad versus now with your uh, high, with your high school coach? Um, I guess I don't know. It doesn't really differ too much. Um, in high school, I kind of show up to practice, and my coach would tell me what to do for the day. Um, and now I just kind of I don't really I kind of program for myself, I guess. Um, but it's a lot similar to how I trained all through high school. Um, as far as equipment goes, um, I usually, I don't get in, I'm not in equipment that often um, as some other equip lifters are, I don't think. Um, but when I'm like training for a meet, I'm usually in like my squat suit and bench shirt one week and then my double suit another week. So I alternate weeks just because my, uh, suits are really tight, and it's pretty painful to have my squat suit, double suit on in the same week, uh, for me anyway. Do you find that um, training equipped adds adds a lot of fatigue? Adds a lot of the what? Adds, adds a lot of fatigue. Oh, um, yeah, definitely, especially with the heavier weight. Um, yeah, I'm definitely a lot more tired so- after, like, when I, after an equipped session. I'm going to guess you have like a, a, a squat day, a bench day, maybe two bench days, and then a deadlift day. Is that kind of how it's set up? Uh, kind of. So um, I squat. Well, I have a heavy squat day, a light squat day. I only deadlift once a week, um, but I bench every day that I go to the gym. Wow. Oh, wow. Just a, a different variation. Gotcha. Do you find that that's hard on your shoulders? Um, No, because, well, one of the days – it's a uh, narrow grip and so i'm not as that wide all the time um if i was in my bench shirt year round that would be very hard on my yeah. shoulders but so do you, do you um, really, like one day all the week is like a, a, a shirt day and then the other days are raw um when i'm in equipment yeah okay so you do keep the bench shirt in there every week because you find that you can recover from that yeah um i do only do bench shirt every other week but um but yeah i definitely recover from that a lot quicker than the uh squat and deadlift yeah i think it it sounds like it's a little different for you um because you've been in equipment for so long that you're more familiar with it than a lot of people would be at this age so you don't have to train you know squat bench shirt and deadlift suit every single week you're able to just rotate off those and still be familiar enough with them yeah, definitely. Um, I know some people can train like raw and equipped, like keep their numbers pretty high in both. Um, but I find like when my my raw lifting technique must be different than my equip because um, as soon as I start training in equipment, all my raw numbers go down a lot. Um, but my equip numbers are fine they're not usually affected by raw training do you find that they go up with raw training yeah definitely well it's funny i was talk. i was talking well thinking about this the other day on raw training versus equipped training and should you be training more raw or versus equipped if you are an equipped lifter and i was thinking that uh equipped or a raw or equipped lifters yeah they, they need to train probably need to train a little bit more in raw mainly because it, it has a really good transfer and it seems like that you obviously or can attest to that yeah definitely um yeah i train raw most of the time um i'm only in equipment probably a few months before me and then i try if i have a big space between competitions i'll try to get in it um at least once so i uh, know how many uh, meets do you try to do a year um, well, I don't really try to do a certain amount of meets. Um, last year I did, um, three. So in 2019, I did three meets. I did nationals, uh, open nationals, and then sub junior, junior worlds. And then I did open worlds, which was in Dubai last November. Okay. Um, and I think the turnaround from junior worlds to open worlds was a little quick for me. Um, cause I had to, usually after a meet, I take a few weeks off, um, from equipment and just kind of light raw training. But for that one, I had to get right back into equipment. Um, but yeah, so 
I try to do minimal amounts of meat, yeah. <laughs> amount of meat. And it, and it especially takes a bigger toll on the body with going through an equipped training cycle and the competing equipped. Um, have you noticed that as you've gotten older and you continue to compete equipped and your numbers go up, do you need more time to recover after a meet? Um, I have noticed, you know, in the past year that after a meet, I literally feel like I've been hit by a truck. Um, but yeah, when I was younger, I didn't really feel like that after a meet. And I don't know if it's just the amount of weight I'm moving now. Um, but yeah, I definitely feel the fatigue a lot more. Because I noticed in, in 2014, Open Pilot Thing says you did five meets that year. 2014. Uh, yeah, I don't. I have to. <laughs> <laughs> you've, been, you've been through so many meets. It's, it's just like, hard to eh. pick out a year. I mean, that was that was like almost seven years ago, so understandable. Right. That's because it shows right, like so you, well, you already can recover from it. Yeah. Right, yeah. So I was obviously still in high school. That was probably my sophomore year of high school. Um, yeah, I definitely did a lot more meets in high school. Like we did a ton of regional meets and, um, like some meets, I think my senior year of high school, I did the Arnold and that was like the week before state and I competed at both of them. And back then it just seemed normal to do meets back to back like that. But now I, I could never imagine doing, doing meet that close to each other. Yeah, I know. Um, I think you're from Wisconsin, right? Yep. And I know that for like high school powerlifting, they're like the season is really in the spring. And so I know for Mississippi, it would pick up and start like early February. And then, you know, every three or four weeks, they would go on to the next meet. And I think I think that's really too soon to to continue to have meets like that. I mean, I can see why they don't spread it out into the fall um, because a lot of the powerlifters come from – um, football and they can't really you know play games and compete you know the next day but I think I think they could do that a little better where they where they stretch it out maybe you know move move a couple meets further into the summer just to give people more yeah. time to recover that's weird though because um here we do so our high school powerlifting season starts in November and then meets usually start in December and then um, go through the winter. Oh wow! Okay, so that's right. Yeah. Football season. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of like a winter sport. I think here. you find too, like people who do less meets a year, probably going to have a better longevity aspect because it's taking less toll on your body. And like Ed Cohen, like Ed Cohen says, you only have so many max effort lifts in your body. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so do you do you feel like um, you're how? Let me put it this way: How long? What's what's your like end goal for powerlifting? What do you what do you want to end accomplish goal. by the end of your career? I mean, you've already got a couple um, couple world titles and plenty of national titles under your belt. Well, I want to win an open world championship. Um, and one of my biggest goals right now is to make it to the World Games, which obviously that was my goal for this year um, because World Games would have been in Alabama next year. But that all got pushed back a year, so that's still my goal for next year. Now, are the are the World Games, um, is that raw and equipped, or is that just specifically equipped? I'm pretty sure it's just equipped. Okay, because a few people that we've had on the show, we've asked about that, and they've I think I know Austin mentioned wanting to go to the World Games, and I think maybe Chloe did. Probably. Yeah, but that's that's usually for people that are up at your level, that's like, you know, the the top of the game right there is going and winning world games. Yeah, definitely. And um, last year when I was in Dubai for Open Worlds, um, I wanted to place top three. And that was kind of like my um, goal is like for to see like how I place for the following year when it would have been my um, the time to qualify for the world games. And I actually I placed fifth in Dubai. Um, but it was very close competition. Like, I think I was only, I want to say, like, 20 kilos, 20 pounds behind second place. But, um, like, if I would have had my total from Canada a few months prior, I would have placed second. So it was very close. <laughs> and that was your first Open Worlds, right? Uh, actually, it wasn't. I competed at Open Worlds 
um, back in, uh, it was in Denver in, I want to say, I want to say my sophomore year of high school. Wow. Um, let's see. Yeah. Uh, 2014. That was one of the 2014 meets. So did you just come out the bat just being strong? <laughs> I guess you could say that. <laughs> <laughs> what do you, because um, obviously you came out when you were very young and you know, obviously you were stronger than most. I mean, from in, in your very first meet at 13 years old, weighing 94 pounds, you put up a 231 squat, 126 bench, and a 264 deadlift, which is almost three times body weight. And that is insane. What, what do you attribute that strength to? Um... I don't know. I've always been active uh, when I was younger. I actually used to run cross country. Um, I played track, or I ran a track too. Um, I don't know. I used to swim a lot, and I think that's where my upper body strength come came from. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I have three brothers, so I just kind of had to be tough, I guess. <laughs> Hashtag genetics. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, Chloe, Chloe was talking about that same thing, and she, she ran track in high school as well. Um, and I think, like, being a multi-sport athlete, it takes a little bit more toll on the body, but I think it, it better prepares you, um, you know, raises that, that GPP like we talk about. And I think that can, that can only be beneficial if, you know, it's used in the right way in, con- in conjunction with powerlifting. Yeah, definitely. I actually – um, so I ran cross country and track throughout middle school. So I was doing cross country powerlifting track um, my seventh and eighth grade year. And then in high school, I ran cross country uh, my freshman and sophomore year. And I didn't do track anymore because I realized that it was uh, taking a lot out of me for powerlifting. And track season usually started right when like the national meets were starting and so um by my junior year i kind of just decided to focus solely on powerlifting if you look at like a nfl players or baseball players or just elite level athletes they were all multi-sport athletes yeah that it just goes to show that an athlete is kind of uh made in not just with one sport but uh, kind of building on their different talents and skills. Yeah, and I, and I think after you've been doing a couple of different sports for a few years, you really figure out what you're passionate about, mm-hmm. and you'll usually drop one of the other ones. Um, like Chloe was talking about, she did dance for so long, and when she started getting seriously into powerlifting, she had to drop out of dance because um, it just – the higher you get in any sport, the more time it's going to require, the more effort and energy you're going to put toward it. So, you know, you kind of kind of got to pick one. Yeah, Well, what's sure. your favorite and what's your best at? I agree. Yeah, you kind of got to focus. You can only really focus on one thing. Um, and if you try to do too many things at once, something's going to get pushed on the back burner pretty much. Absolutely. That, that open worlds, um, the first one I did back in 2014, I was running cross country while I was training for that, actually. <laughs> so wow. I would I would go to cross country practice after school and then my coach would stay late at the gym and help me train after that so wow that's, what, that's a lot what did what did you do for recovery back then when you were doing both back sports then? She ran. Uh, nothing nothing really specific <laughs> i guess one thing is i really prioritize my sleep which is probably weird from someone that young um but i remember like that summer before training for worlds in Hungary, um, I would like go to bed by nine every night and wake up at seven every morning. Oh, that's perfect. Golly. Yeah. I mean, we, like we talked about in the last episode, sleep is, is so huge for recovery. It's the number one performance enhancer in the world that people skip out on. That's awesome that you were doing that though. It's such a young age too. Most people, Mm -hmm. most kids, I know, I know me, for instance, I I wanted to stay up as late as I could. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah um i still try to prioritize sleep a lot i do um i do shoot for like eight to nine hours a night but with school sometimes it gets a little crunch there <laughs> absolutely so why skip out on the why not do raw meats you I, it's we know you we done you've done two of them and you seem like you're pretty good at raw lifting so why not compete raw more um well 
like I said before, um, when I start training equipment, my raw numbers kind of plummet, <laughs> but, um, so I just, I like equip lifting so much. I don't want to really take the time to prep for a raw meat necessarily. You, you um, like that, uh, probably, I don't know that raw meat that I did. Um, I think that was like the state Wisconsin state open. Um, I had done it just because I think that was my freshman year of college and I was kind of adjusting to, um, lifting by, on my own and, uh, like away from my coach and I didn't have, um, the help to get into equipment, but I still wanted to do a meet. Um, so that's why I did that. Um, but my coach was actually helping me at that meet and we were just kind of standing there in between attempts and like, hmm, what do we do now? Cause <laughs> there's not really any, there's not really any prep for a raw meet. Like don't have to get my straps up, wrap my knees, um, snap my belt, anything like that. It's a lot of downtime. So yeah. what, what is it about equip lifting that you're attracted to? Like, like what, what keeps you going with equip lifting? Um, I don't know. I just, it's, I just love it. I don't know. I've done it since I was in seventh grade back then. It was all there was, was equipped lifting. Um, it's probably the amount of weights. I like moving more weight, um, than I would be able to raw. And it's kind of like nerve wracking to get under a weight that's like over a hundred pounds more than you can do without the equipment and just do it like nothing. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I like lifting big weights, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> That's as simple as it could be. I, I love it. I love it. I just like yep. big weights. <laughs> Did, um, no, I know in Mississippi we had uh, like equipped high school lifting, but we didn't use bench shirts. And I know like Alexander was talking about in Louisiana, they did in Texas. They do. Um, did they use bench shirts in Wisconsin? Um, for high school lifting, we didn't until we went to nationals. Um, but I think after I graduated, I believe they started incorporating bench shirts into the high school state meet, and you could wear it at regional meets if you wanted to. Oh, wow. What was it like when you first got into a bench shirt? Was it just like the other equipment? You fell in love with it? No, <laughs> definitely not. No, I remember uh, first getting into a bench shirt, and I was just like, wishing like oh i wonder when it'll be that i can get into a bench shirt and it'll be just like easy as putting on a squat suit or double suit but it never does it's way more technical than squatting and deadlifting in equipment it's, it's crazy how how much difference like an inch or even a half inch on like the sleeves turned in or out can make on how easy it is to touch and that's oh, yeah. that's one thing i enjoyed about equip lifting is it's so much more technical and you have to learn the equipment to be good at it. Because I, I love when people that's say, that's a big know, one. I could do what you do. If I had a bench shirt. Yeah, yeah. no, you couldn't. It's a skill. It's yeah, a, it's yeah, a yeah. much more it really skill. is. Yeah, definitely adds another aspect to it. Like you can't just throw on equipment and lift 100 pounds more. You got to know how to use it. Mm -hmm. That's true. Very true. So well, let's get into, you said you program for yourself. You do, you, you do your own training. So what's kind of like your, what's your philosophy right now about your training? What, what do you keep? always keep in no matter what um well i do the three main lifts mm -hmm. um and then i do a lot of accessories so like chest shoulders back triceps um and it's pretty much the same week to week um i vary the like sets and reps but nothing too spectacular <laughs> like you just keep it simple you know it yeah. works for you you do it so are you more of a, a lower volume on the main lifts and a little bit more higher volume on the accessories? Because you find that that just builds yeah. up more? Yeah, definitely. Sometimes I'll do um, higher volume on like the, my well, obviously my lighter days. Um, but yeah, a lot of it is lower volume. Do you use like a, um, like a linear periodization model or is it kind of like mixed in with some RPE in there? Um. <laughs> this is gonna sound bad, but I just kind of do what I'm feeling that day. <laughs> Chloe said the same thing. Yeah, she's like, like it's, they ask her what RPE she's doing. She's like, uh, light. 
Like, <laughs> yeah, light, heavy. That's what um, a girl that I lived with now uh, and in college, she has like a program and stuff. And she's like, what are you doing today? I'm like, I don't know. We'll find out when I get there. Really? So, yeah, yeah. that's interesting. So, let's say, so you might have like a, you know, you know, it's a lower body day or like a squat day. Right, What's right. Like- well, yeah, I do. I have my lifts planned out but as okay. far as like sets and reps that you just go with what, you, what you're feeling I yeah think, i think that's becoming more common nowadays i've, I've seen that around it's, yeah and it's you kind of go until you hit like what let's say an rpe9 mm-hmm. like and then you might do your back offs until you hit an rpe9 and, and whatever rep range you feel like you're or you, you're doing and then the next week you might take it down two yeah. or three two or three reps and do heavier weight yeah i think I think it's a good style of training. I like to do it. Um, it works for a lot of people, but I think you should only use it if you've been lifting for a while and you know your body. So, yeah. like like yeah. younger lifters, I would go with more like the the linear model. You know, percentage based. Um, get your training in. You know, maybe adjust it a little bit depending on how something feels in the gym. But it's it's a little harder for somebody that hasn't been lifting a whole a whole lot to to go in and have no idea what they're gonna do. Yeah, have a prescribed yeah, it's- reps. Yeah, it's definitely different now because I'm not really training for a meet right now. So that kind of plays a role. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. You just go in and have fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> how did uh, how did COVID affect your training when it hit? Were you were you still at school at the point? Um, so I was in – I go to school at UW Lacrosse. And um, last year – I was living in the dorms and I went home for spring break and they had said that we were going to be off for a month online and then we'd come back. Um, by the end of the week, they said we were online for the rest of the semester. So I moved home and um, we actually had a squat rack and a bench rack and like one set of weights at home. Um, and I have my own barbell. So I was able to pretty much um, keep training. I like brought everything in from the shed and I set up a little weight room in our basement. Um, and yeah, I kept lifting. And then when I decided that I wanted to get back in equipment and sign up for a meet, um, we moved the weights out to our shed and my dad kind of finished off the shed. And, um, you probably see there, I think there's a picture on my Instagram, a little bit of it, but, um, he did an awesome job doing in the shed and, uh, my coach actually came over a few times to help me with that, um, in equipment. So he would like help me with squat and then my parents would help me with my bench shirt and, um, deadlift suit. Wow. So, so, so COVID really didn't affect you a whole lot. I mean, you just sound like you kind of just kept in the groove and cause you you had that, you know, equipment at home. Awesome. Yeah, I was like, as soon as I got the email that we were, uh, like, back, we were online, and I was going to have to go back home, I was trying to figure out, um, like, oh, that's good, I can go to the high school gym and live with my coach, then it'll work out perfect, and then it's like, well, they're closing down the public schools, too, so it's like, boom, 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 I just figured it out and got everything put together. You talked about your bar, what kind of barbell do you have? Is it a rogue power bar or the? Yeah, it is. The oh, Ohio power. Do you just Ohio keep that thing in, in your in your car? Gun. You're like, if you if you have a like a rest, go to a rest stop. You do a few curls and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually. So I train at um, Iron Physique Gym in Lacrosse, and they allow you to keep barbells there. So I have like a lock on my bar, and I just keep it at the gym, um, and I use it whenever I go. Awesome! Wow. I wish we had that. That'd be cool. Yeah, we need we need to get us a barbell. Yeah. So so does your school have yeah. have like a like a team or a club for powerlifting, or are you just on your own? Um, I think they started um, last year or the year before they started uh, like a strength club. Um, but I lived off campus, um, and I've just can, kind of been um, lifting independently. Do, do a lot of the guys at the gym come up to you when you're squatting those big weights and say, how do you do that? No, no. They nobody don't. really comes I up bet, to me. <laughs> I bet they're like, damn, she's stronger than me. I got I to gotta start working more. <laughs> yeah. No, it's really cool. Um, 
the gym owners actually they after i won uh last year in canada they reached out and asked if um i could print some pictures and they have them hanging up on the wall in the gym that's awesome so yeah wow. that's that's good to see support from from outside people yeah for for your success in powerlifting because it is it's a pretty small sport right now so that brings me to my next question what do you think um like the ipf and the usapl can do or what do you think they can do to increase the popularity and how well people know the sport? Um, that's a tough one, but I think meets like the Arnold Sports Festival, um, those are pretty, like, that's a pretty popular meet. Um, it gets a lot of, like, audience members and, um, I think where USAPL is going with the big screens and everything, just putting on a show is really um, drawing more people to it. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. How how far away do you think we'll be um, until like the big powerlifting meets, like nationals and worlds, are televised? <laughs> uh, if you had to yeah, give, out a, give out a guess. I honestly have no idea. <laughs> She's like, they'll be televised when I'm on there. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we, uh, so we've asked um, Alexandra and Chloe this, um, being a girl in powerlifting, because um, there's there's not a whole lot, you know, most of the powerlifters are guys. Um, how do you think, what would you say to girls that are interested in getting into strength training and powerlifting, but they're just not, not totally sure about it yet? They don't want to look like a guy or, or get too big? Um, to just go for it and do it. If it's something that interests you, I would definitely say to do it. Now about the comment about looking like a guy or getting too big, it takes a lot of hard work to like get i guess ripped or jacked um so you won't get there by accident <laughs> yeah i think people That's a pretty good line yeah. you won't get there by accident i like that yeah people, people have a misconception about how long it takes to put on a substantial amount of muscle oh yeah like it's, it's like you're not going to go to the gym for a month or two and then look like this guy over here like <laughs> thank it, you it, it takes a while <laughs> yeah i think I, you're exactly right uh, people think you can gain like naturally 10 or 12 pounds a year well maybe in your first year you might do that but then after a couple of years it starts to slow down a pretty good bit but yeah definitely i think it all comes back to mindset if you believe you can do it you might be able to do it yeah so that, that yeah kinda... another thing go ahead for people who are like just starting um one of the biggest things is to just keep an open mind is what i would say and welcome advice um and criticism because it helps a lot. I know my first world meet um, in Killeen, Texas, I my form was so bad <laughs> compared to all the other lifters. And um, my dad has is he's like my partner for all this. He does all the research and stuff. And he's like, hey, this uh, girl is squatting a ton of weight. Like you should try switching your stance up to this and. Yeah, so it's just a lot of like uh, watching other people, seeing what works, what doesn't, and just figuring out what works for you. So like trial and error. Yeah, I think that's one of the big things too. People don't take that time to get that trial and error because you, you think you're going to go in there and you might see stuff like you said. You might see someone that's doing something a little bit different, and you do that, and it doesn't really work for you. So you get a little discouraged, and you're thinking, "Well, how do they do that when I can't do that?" Well, it's just not built for you. It's not made for you. So find something else. Right, yeah. When I first started lifting, uh, my squat stance was probably about as wide as like a sumo deadlift. Um, and uh, after that meet in 2013, I brought my stance way in, and I'm a pretty narrow squatter now, um, and that works a lot better for me. <laughs> yeah, sometimes that's just what it takes is is continuing to try new things and finding like the right combination mm -hmm. of you know stance width feet angle um you know high bar low bar your grip because like all everything and especially like the squat and bench everything you do and change can have like a continuous effect on something else yeah um so you know that just takes like trying different combinations of stuff you know when you try something and it works keep it 
If it doesn't work, try something else. Yep. Don't you find though that like sometimes something just clicks, like it just cause something just comes out of nowhere and you just like wow that felt really good or I I did I've never done that before but that that was perfect that just felt good. Do you find that happens sometimes? Yeah, I guess I feel that a lot with deadlifting. I kind of have a love hate relationship with deadlift, and <laughs> some days it just clicks and it feels really good, and but most of the time it's not. <laughs> <laughs> So you said um, you when you're prepping for a meet, you switch off between um, a week in the the, dead, the deadlift suit and the week in the squat suit. Um, what kind of deadlift suit do you have? Uh, Titan Velocity. Okay. Uh, I've never gotten in a deadlift suit. I've always just turned my squat suit backwards. Um, how... Yeah, that's what I used to do when we were younger. I've never younger. heard that. I didn't really? know that was a thing. Yeah. So how does that work? Yeah. Pretty sure it's because... Explain, explain it to me real quick. I'm pretty sure it's because it'll be higher up on your chest then. Because deadlift suits come up further, usually, um, than squat suits. So I think turning around, you get that higher neckline. Interesting. Added, and, it, and it's kind of like, you know, there's you get down in your deadlift and it's got that spring upward. Um, and like she's saying, the, the back part on the squat suit, it comes up higher. Mm-hmm. And the deadlift suit comes up even higher. Um, and do you pull sumo or conventional? Yeah, sumo. Have you found that the deadlift suit helps at all, a lot? I actually get quite a bit out of my deadlift suit, a lot more than most people. And I've been thinking about that, actually, um, over the past year, like, why I get so much more, and I honestly couldn't tell you. Um, But, yeah, I get quite a bit out of my deadlift suit. Does it feel similar to a squat suit? Like I said, said, I've never even tried one. Um, Yeah, it's pretty similar. Um, yeah, I guess, I don't know, the, uh, for me, the deadlift suit, I get a sumo suit, so the, um, legs are angled out more, um, yeah, as far as, like, how it feels when you have it on, it's pretty similar to a squat suit. Okay, I may have to invest in one, I know they have a pretty, pretty high price tag on them, but when, uh, when my <laughs> squat suit stops working, I'll invest in a velocity. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah i actually um i have sumo deadlifted my entire powerlifting career except for one year uh, my sophomore year of high school i um got injured and i couldn't pull sumo so i actually had to pull conventional for that year and i hated every second of it <laughs> <laughs> so what, yeah. what would you say is uh i like to ask everybody this what do you think is the most underrated muscle in all of powerlifting? Most underrated muscle? I mean, I don't know because um, I don't know what I would say would be considered underrated, but uh, one thing would be lats um, or triceps, definitely. There it is. I agree with the lats. I agree with the triceps. Because, <laughs> I mean, you use the lats in mm-hmm. everything, in oh, squat dude, bench sure. and deadlift. Absolutely. And but, no, everybody likes a big back, but nobody really focuses on the lats. Yeah, I agree. But everybody likes a big bench too. <laughs> I mean, you're not the lats wrong. do come into play. Lats and triceps do come into play in that one. I find yeah. that after I got my lats to actually contribute more, it it went straight through yeah, the roof. Yeah, all of them go up. Yeah, definitely for bench. Um, I actually I used to bench really high up on my chest, and I would so I would use a straight sleeve bench shirt. And just last year, uh, before Canada, I got an angled sleeve bench shirt for the first time. And once I figured out how to use it after dumping it towards my face a few times, um, my bench has gone up quite a bit. Okay. Wow. I just, um, last week I was benching and I had my Fury tear a little bit. Like I just got a custom one back this summer. I've had like 12 sessions in it and it, it uh it started to rip on one side and I dropped the weight a little bit. It ripped on the other side. And so I've had to send it back to Titan. And I was pretty disappointed. Yeah, I use a Super Katana. That's low cut collar. I've been thinking about upgrading to a Super Katana anyway, so it might be the perfect time to. Everyone said to do it. Hmm? Everyone said to do it. Everyone you talk to. I know. All but... the good lifters do it, man. <laughs> I know, but it's, it's it's got a good price tag on it, just oh, like yeah. the Velocity too. <laughs> Well, hey, uh, Natalie Hansen is pretty good at benching, and she doesn't use a katana. So, oh. 
There it is. One in a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> no, but last question I got for you. What is, because you know, our, our show is more geared toward younger lifters, um, you know, high school, college lifters that want to get into powerlifting strength training. If you give them one piece of advice, what would it be? Um, have fun, I guess. Uh, I guess I would say the most would be kind of what I said earlier about keeping an open, keeping an open mind um, and welcoming advice, honestly. There we go. I like the welcoming advice part. Yeah, always be willing to learn. A lot of a lot of people don't like advice. I mean, um, I assume you know you have a lot of experience. So, do you ever try to give advice to some people and they kind of reject it or or don't think you know what you're talking about? Um, I guess I've never really had that happen. Um, but I do try to. So when I'm back at home and um. I would go to the weight room and help out with the younger lifters, like the high school, um, during the powerlifting club practice. So I would try to give them advice, and they usually all know who I am, so um, they listen to what I say and um, try it out. I mean, yeah, you got the you got the qualifications. Oh, for sure. <laughs> You've been doing it quite a while. You know what you're talking about. <laughs> Mostly. <laughs> Mostly. Still learning always, though. <laughs> oh, yeah. I definitely always can take any advice I can get. Um, I've been talking with, you know, James Townsend. Um, he's the open world team coach. So since I made the team last year, I talked with him pretty frequently about my training, and he helps me quite a bit, too. What did he say when you said, I just go in and I just, whatever I feel like I do and I do? <laughs> What did he say? Um, no, I didn't say that direct, <laughs> uh, actually to him, but um, I do just send him what I do, and he hasn't said anything. He he gives me some like workouts to do. So. If it works, but, don't fix it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. There we go. That's if it ain't it. broke, don't fix it, yeah. Almond, you got anything else? I, I, I don't. It's been a great episode with you. Thank you for coming on. Absolutely. Yeah, thank, thank you. you for having me. Thank you so much for your time. Um, what's what's the next meet you plan to do if, you know, COVID doesn't? Uh, well, that would depend on when they release the schedule for next year, unless I haven't seen it. But I am planning on hopefully doing the Arnold um, and the Nationals and hopefully Open Worlds. Nice. There we go. It's a, it's a pretty solid list of meets. Absolutely, yeah. Hopefully, I'll get there one day. But <laughs> better get a super katana first. <laughs> super katana and a velocity. And a death suit. There we go. <laughs> there you go. That's what I need. Well, all right, Taylor, thank you so much for your time. We wish you healthy training and um, good training in the future, many PRs to come, and uh, good luck in uh, your school and training. Thank you. All right. Thanks for listening, folks. We'll see you all next time.